I usually uh, uh, open with a Lakota prayer or I uh, play a song on the flute that has meaning. I want to do something a little different if you all it, it, it indulge me. I want you to just take your elbows quite comfortably with your hands so that your fingers are closed like this and your thumbs are touching about four inches from your eyes. And I want you to take a nice deep breath. Inhale under the navel and fill your chest and then exhale when you're ready. And try to imagine how that configuration of your thumbs looks. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine seeing that. So look at it and slowly close your eyes and see if you can still see that configuration. Maybe it's not in color. Maybe it's shadows. Maybe it's just something a little different. Maybe it's got different colors. But And if it, you don't quite have it, if it disappeared, very just open a little bit of your eyes, just enough to see that those again. And your goal is not to try, but just to relax into seeing that interesting shape of your thumbs. Do it three or four times. I always have to do it three or four or five or six times until I can hold that image just for a couple of seconds. Inhale and exhale comfortably. Allow your imagination to work. And each of you probably have gotten some glimpse, at least of one thumb or this part of it. Not that imagination now move into a different way. I want you to imagine that what we're going to do in the next hour is going to make a big difference in your life, in your wellness, in your well-being, in your journey. Now relax your fingers, take your, keep your thumbs together and move your palms together into a prayer pose. And then take your palms in that prayer pose and bring them to your chest. And take that good feeling, those good wishes, that imagination, and send it to all creatures in the world. All those that are suffering, the imbalances that our species is causing, giving thanks to the responsibilities they're still keeping, the water, the air, the mountains, the trees, the birds. Nice deep breath, exhale, come back to our situation of learning here together. All right, that might have helped a little bit of all the busyness that you guys are doing today also. Okay, I'm going to start right into this because I want us to do, you know, I'm doing lectures two and three times a week now with the book and giving presentations and they've got rules about how many minutes to talk before the Q&A. And I want us to jump right into it, if we can. Um, so I'm going to start with showing, uh, let me see if they're going to let me share the screen. So uh, Hillary, if it's, if it's easy for you to share the screen, do so. Can that, for giving me the, the, the host, can you do that? Yeah. And if you can, if, if you can't, well, let's see if that worked. That worked perfectly. By the way, an applause for Hillary. I was telling her earlier that, you know, um, I've been doing NPR and, uh, uh, you know, famous authors and doing podcasts uh, since, since the new book came out uh, with Penguin and, and Random House, really pushing it. And I am so impressed with what Hillary has done in organizing this conference. It's just, uh, I, I, uh, I hope everybody just really uh, acknowledges that for her. Okay, so... Um, I see we've got a magic quadrant for unified communications there. And what I'm going to go, by the way, if you can, see, can you all see the screen? Just nod if you can, or give me a thumbs up. Yeah, this is the, this is where I'm at right now. See this little, uh, this little uh, palapa. That's where I'm, this is where I'm at right now. And then um, this is me about 90 steps away on the ocean with uh yeah, you know, with my little guacamaya that's on the on the board, right? And so that's where I'm at right now. And um, what I'm going to show you is something that a number of you have seen, and it's the worldview chart. Now, I want us all to do something I haven't I had I did with the clinical psychology program not long ago, um, 
and, uh, uh, and, it, and it worked pretty well. In fact, right at the beginning, some one of the one of the clinical psychology uh, uh, faculty just saw this worldview chart and and just jumped on me and, and said, "For us, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, our clinical psychology program and psychology in general, and I, and I know certainly me, we're uh, you know we're we don't have we're not on we're not rigid hierarchy or fear based or without strong social purpose or focusing on self or or materialistic or any of these things in the left column. So I don't really get this." And I went, well, that's, can we do some examples of that? But I didn't have to because her colleagues jumped right in and, and said, well, all of us and all our great poets and all of our religions, they all touch someplace here and there on the things that we're calling common indigenous worldview manifestations. And, um, and so the, um, uh, Hold on one second. You guys all hear my chihuahua in the background, right? Just hold on. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, they, you know, they, they, they started saying, well, wait a minute. And I'm not going to say all the things that they said, but in about a half an hour, she said to me, oh, I get it. It's not that we don't know the benefit of a lot of these things on the left side that you're looking at. Authoritarianism, uh, uh, that, that these things are problematic, that, um, that we don't really use trance like we just did at the opening here, that learning is fragmented, yeah. that, that um, you know, uh, vitality is, is not a, a, part, a big priority, et cetera, right? And um, uh, that nature is dangerous. You know, it's not that those things, once we think about them, are not part of the of the, of, of what we think is is good. It's that they're not in the systems that we live in. And she said, "I get that. I can see that the systems themselves, education, the whole field of psychology, the the corporatism, the governments, essentially, we are going according to the things on the left side of the, of the of it, and then we wind up." inconsistent with what is deeper inside of ourselves. And I, I, I kind of, what the, the sort of part of me since I've been doing this for so long was I kind of wanted to say, well, yeah, duh, you know, but I didn't because that would have been a stupid thing for me to do and, and wrong. Instead, I went, thank you so much for pointing that, that out because this isn't something that belongs to a group of people. It just so happens that the few indigenous cultures that are still able against all odds to hold on to a worldview that guided us for 99% of human history up until around 8,000 years ago, uh, but it belongs to all of us. And so um, I offered this, this chart as a sort of a, a, a place where we can begin to, to dialogue about what is it that's happening in our world that keeps us on the left side? What can we do to see this continuum and find a way to move to the right? And I'll just, you can read the, the preface and see why in the history of worldview study and the Institute of Noetic Sciences says that worldview is the most important thing that we don't do. And uh, uh, Edgar Mitchell went the seventh man to walk on the moon. You know, he, when he was up there looking down on the earth, he came back and, and fought, founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And this is their priority is worldview. And he himself said only a handful of people understand a handful of visionaries. He says, uh, understand that, that the solutions to our problems rest in the worldview that we had that, uh, is a kinship worldview, the nature-based worldview that I'm giving uh, credibility to the existing cultures that are at all, you know, that are losing it, but those that are holding on to it by referring to it as an indigenous. And all of us have the right to, to do that. It's not misappropriation to, to teach that worldview. Trying to duplicate a tribe is a different story. You have to know the language, you have to have been raised in it, you have to know the ceremonies, et cetera, right? 
And so we see complementarity between these positions that we're in because we're all guilty of the things on this com common dominant worldview manifestation on the left. I mean, if there, is there anyone guilty, not guilty of one of these? I'm going to go up and down it real slow. Because, I mean, maybe there's a few of you that are. I mean, I'm starting to get to where I don't, I do my best not to be leading myself in the ways that are on the left side. But I'm guilty of, 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 of each one of those probably at some point in time. Um, I know very few individuals who are living according to the things on the right. Um, but we've got to see this as a continuum. And historically, as I started to say, worldviews stopped dialogue. In fact, I have a lot of liberal friends, progressive friends, and colleagues at Fielding who won't look at this chart because they say this is a dangerous binary. This is an either or. And that's wonderful to, to think this way because the scholarship on worldview shows what? That the dominant worldview is a binary worldview, that this is how we're, our systems work. We're an either or system, you know, George Bush, you know, you're either with us or against us, right? And so, of course, they're going to look at this because they're operating from the dominant worldview as a, as, a, as a rigid binary. And it's easy to do when one is saying the one side is favorable. But this is a true dichotomy. And true dichotomies from an indigenous non-binary worldview, which scholars refer to the indigenous worldview as, we recognize that all opposites have some quality of complementarity that in some way, the understandings of the two bring us into a place where we are in, are in a flowing balance. You know, the idea of the balance of nature, that's kind of a, a misnomer. It's not that simple. Nature is dynamic. It's, it's, it's chaotic. It's ever changing. It, its focus is, a, is on diversity and creating diversity. But it's also an, a oneness, mutual aid phenomenon. Even Darwin said that when he talked about, you know, that, and then people, uh, you know, he said, what I'm talking about here is going to be about this long-term ability of, uh, of people and animals and, and plants to, to adapt in ways that take what worked the best to go. Well, then the neo-Darwinist came up with social, social, what's called social Darwinism, which is the you know, dog, you know, uh, the dog eat dog thing, you know, the, the, uh, uh, this, this, this competition uh, phenomenon that is guiding our world right now. But looking for this duality is common. Hillary Webb's book, uh, Yanatan and Yanatan, um, she's a good friend of mine and she's lived with the Andean people. And she has a great book on non uh, dual reality. I'll tell you a story that, that represents it. If you look at the origin stories of all of our cultures um, in the last, say, 5,000 years, Romulus and Ramus, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Hercules and Iphicles, the list is long. These twin hero stories, you'll find that the solar twin, one is always a solar twin, dynamic and strong and direct. The other is a lunar twin, reflective and passive. These concepts have been misrepresented as masculine and feminine. Well, the solar is dominated because what has happened? Romulus kills Ramus. Jacob steals Aso's birthright. Hercules, everybody knows, but nobody knows is equally powerful. Iphicles, who had a different subtle power, right? So even our origin stories have got us out of balance onto this dominant worldview side, Right. But now you take the Navajo or in any indigenous twin hero story. And I'll just give you one example, the Navajo story where the two come to the father. You got Monster Slayer. Well, what do you think he is? That's the, the, the solar twin, right? And child born of the water. That's the lunar twin. And they go to fight the monsters, right? And of course, the monsters are those things that are in all of us and have always been in all, all of us, even when we all were you know, indigenous worldview modality, they still were in us. That's why they had ways to, to prevent it and to stop it and, and to organize society so that egalitarianism and, 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 and women and all these things were in the right order, right? 
And so in the this, this story, they come to the monsters, which again are the jealousy, fear, anger, all this stuff. And, uh, and this, this monster had long arms. It's the monster of jealousy. And Monster Slayer says, no problem, I can get it. He draws out an arrow and starts to shoot it when Child Born of the Water says, oh, please, please, brother, put it away. He's so fast with those arms. He'll get that arrow, throw it out of the way, and then he'll get us. And we won't, we won't make it to the top of the mountain where we're, where we're, where we're, where we're supposed to get, we'll go. So, you know, Hercules would have said, Diphicles, oh, you sissy or hey i i know what i'm doing i'm great shot or something like that right but no monster slayer puts his arrow away and says well what should we do what do you think is be better child born of the water says i think we should sing to him so they put their arms together and they sang to the monster and the monster having never been treated that way lets them go right that kind of a thing right so this idea of of, of looking at this to stimulate dialogue Whereas historically worldviews were about religion, mostly Christian religion, or science, the Abrahamic religion versus science, right? Uh, or then they became science versus science or religion versus religion. In fact, if you put in worldview in Amazon.com right now, you'll see thousands of books. 99% of them are about religion, right? And they, so they try to kind of stop the dialogue. This is about, wow, okay, how is rigid hierarchy causing a problem in, in our world? How are our fear-based thoughts causing a problem? How is living without a strong social purpose? How is focus on self and personal gain, you know, in contrast to non-hierarchical courage and fearless trust in the universe, which we can talk about if somebody wants, uh, emphasis on community welfare instead of punishment or, or you know, that, you know, all these things that, that, that are, you know, my last two books are, are, are all about, right? And, um, so this, I want us to talk to really, to, to really talk about this, this chart. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've got some exercises that we can do and, and things that we can, we can play with to help, you know, to help flush something out that's in your thoughts about all the questions that come up with, with this, uh, from, do I have the right to do this or am I, you know, am I misappropriating indigeneity? Uh, is, um, uh, am I, am I, you know, whatever your questions are, right? Uh, so let's start right now. I'll leave this up for a second. Um, and, uh, um, let's, let's just see what you can, what kind of things you might have in mind now, because believe me, I can talk forever. So anybody, Elisa, come on. What do you think? What are you thinking about this chart? What do you what what questions come to mind? What problematics? What challenges? What uh, you know? Whatever. What comes to mind? Well, this is not the first time I've seen this, so, no, I'm, no, so I'm I, just... that's why I, I I didn't pick on you. <laughs> no worries. So I just love hearing you talk about it, and I think that. It's definitely not a binary, but more of, um, of course, you know, I try to be on the correct side of it all, but sometimes you end up for whatever reason, kind of on a spectrum of it and try to push it to be as um, holistic and as possible, but sometimes it's just not possible or you need to move people, help usher people towards um more open and well let's take your let, 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 i'm gonna let's just stay with what you're saying so um let's talk about your 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 workplace and your work the people that you work with and engage in your work um uh are would you say overall not individual and once in a while but overall that your workplace is non-hierarchical no okay would you say that it i work mostly with with government so yeah, yeah. so but would you say hier that, hierarchical with a capital h with a capital h right and would you say that they represent and i, and I haven't taught what fearless what fearlessness is yet but you, it's a trust in the universe once you once courage brings you to take action would you say that courage and fearless trust in the universe are operational and and and, and, and fundamental in the system Yeah, probably overall not. it's yeah overall it's, yeah i mean it's 
That's a tough one for. Oh, again. Yeah. The problem. I'm trying to move it. So if we dissect it, I think we. But what I can do, we can go through this, right? We can look at this. Do they see the world in, in with animistic, biocentric words? Are they talking about animals and what they've learned from animals? Are they recognizing spiritual energies in your daily in your daily work? Um, uh, the, the power of prayer, for example, um, is generosity seen as the highest expression of courage or standing up to somebody? Uh, is trance-based learning seen as natural and, 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 and used regularly like ceremony has done? Is conflict resolution a return to community or is it more something like punishment or, or, or uh, getting even? Um, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the laws of nature, the primary driver, right? Um, uh, is there a high respect for for women? Um, right. Is thinking not, in other words. And this is where I, I really see yeah. it as more of a, of, you know, just not that binary, but more of a, a spectrum where on certain, you know, you, you land different places on different numbers of like what you've numbered there. So in terms of women in the in the workplace, there's been a lot of movement there, but not quite. Right. We're not yeah, so, yet. Exactly. There's still more work to do. Whereas on other things, haven't even started. Exactly. So, okay. And so this continuum is what we've got to look at. Now, what we know is we are destroying Earth systems. We are creating constant wars. And we have egalitarian prejudice racism, right? So we we almost can jump to the conclusion and say that those though there are people and individuals and groups trying like heck to move over onto this right side. And I, I'm I'm on at least six foundations doing that that are doing great work. We are not close to living with these as primary, right? Now let's take the, the hierarchy. The Lakota, just, you know, I am Irish and I have the family stories and the pictures that are uncorroborated of my Cherokee heritage with uh, my great grandmother having escaped from the Trail of Tears and was adopted by the Caldwell family, etc. But I was made a relative of the Oglala Lakota. So I'm, my spiritual journey isn't what my certainty of blood is. My spiritual journey comes from one of the seven sacred ceremonies of the Lakota. And I'm a, I'm a sun dancer with the Lakota. And so I know the Lakota. And I've lived with them. I worked there. So the Lakota in the old days, um, right now on the reservation, lifespan is only 49 years of age. That's the, the nature of our prison camps we call reservations. But in the old days, they were completely matriarchal, matrilineal, as most indigenous cultures, relatively peaceful. They were, they were uh, gatherers, planters, hunters. Um, but when it came time to go on a buffalo hunt, they became authoritarian, one of the things on the left side. They be, got a rigid hierarchy, one of the things on the left side, right? And a person would be put into that position of leadership because in a hunt, they had to have that hierarchy in order to provide food for the whole community to make sure that there was this coordination that one person could, could, could do, right? But each time a person was named, it was different every hunt. All right, it was different every hunt. So you're following some one guy the next day, and then the next day he's following you, right? Or whatever. They also didn't do it for the rest of the year, just for the buffalo hunts, right? So this is confirming what you're what you what you're saying about this about this as a as a continuum. Thank you so much. So who else? Rural? You know, it just uh, I guess I I immediately go to personal issues like um, materialistic and um, dualistic and um, all these things that I, I have to acknowledge um, and, and isolated. And there was something about, uh, I don't know, interacting with a lot of people or inter or being alone. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of writing and reading and that's very solitary. Um, so I guess I just, uh, and, and maybe this has, it relates to what you just said that there's a place perhaps for each side here in certain circumstances and that there's no right or wrong here there's it's more of a 
um, maybe it's more situational. I, I, I don't know. I, I, this sounds a little relativistic. I, I, I'm not sure, but but I'm 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 struggling with perhaps self-justifying or something, or or finding things in the left side that that do feel like there might be a place for them. Yeah, let's take an example. Let's give an example. Would it be uh, words used to deceive others? Are you thinking like, well, there's sometimes that that's a good thing. Like they say a white lie is a good thing. Is that what you're meaning? No, I'm looking more at, uh, and I'm sorry, some of them are obviously tougher to justify, but I think there was something about uh, interacting with lots of people or, or being. Well, well, look, well, let's, let's take one. Let's take one as an example, you know, and like you say, it's, if we're in this left side, which all of us are too much, there is a tendency to want to be defensive and, and protected. I see this all the time, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm allowing you that. But now I'm giving you a chance to say, uh -huh. here's an example, like the one that I gave with the Lakota and the Buffalo. And so um, let's see, we got... Uh, oh, here, uh, 18, minimal contact with others right. versus high interpersonal engagement and touching touching yeah okay. and and so I, I i just recognize that in my own life i i am very isolated and i i don't see that necessarily as a positive or a negative i i just um it just is my situation so i you know i don't know is that justifying is that i don't know what no, I, I mean i don't know and you you would know your life but yeah. I, you know it would see like based on 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 understandings of of psychology and, and my partner darcy narvaez is uh talking about child children growing up in isolation there's probably a lot of evidence that uh although the you know you could be an exception or i could be an exception that um that contact with others when it's missing to a degree that you're missing out on a, on a component of, of health that, and, and the idea of oneness that uh, is, is very much causal to some of the alienations that we have. Right. So, so one could argue, and it doesn't mean that you're supposed to go out and, and change your personality and be an extrovert and or, or, or go out into the world. It just means that, that if we're looking at this in a systemic way, as a cultural thing, if, ever, if if most people most people were like that, which we are, you go into a big city like Chicago and it's crowded, but the, the alienation and the separation and the and the singularity of of, of 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 what we do is lonely. It's lonely, right? And so we've got to look at these and have the kind of discussions that you and I are having right now about. Okay, wow. Well, maybe my job and my emphasis, but then you got to go and, 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 and go into what's called the cat fawn connection. And the cat fawn connection was my, my, my vision on how to move in, in the proper place on this. And that is, you, you've got to look at fear, authority, words, and nature. That's fawn. And ask yourself, well, is my rationalization of minimal contact with others is that is there a fear somewhere lurking in the background of that an early childhood fear another fear and and, and, and is my coping with and, 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 and rationalizing minimal contact does it have anything to do with the unconscious hypnotic defense mechanisms i have put into place in order to do that that's 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 that would be the fear and then it's the authority f-a-w-n on whose authority do i rationalize that it's it is healthier for me to have minimal contact with others and where did that come from and and it, was i hypnotized by that by the because the virtue of fear causes us to go into spontaneous hypnosis all creatures become hyper suggestible to the, the to the words of a perceived trusted authority figure and so then you go to words what words am i using in the english language unlike the verb based indigenous languages really easy to concretize you know if you say i have to be on time to a meeting you create a stress response internally if you say i want to be on time for a meeting that stress response doesn't occur that's how powerful words are right and uh, and how sacred that that they are and then once you say oh you know what i i see that although i'm comfortable and happy you know uh like you know uh with with my lifestyle with minimal contact uh you know, I can see where uh, there would be some advantages for me to move 
in, in some places into out of this continuum. And now that I see the source of some of it and I understand it better, I will move into instead of the dominant ideas about fear, which are we don't like it. We don't want to be anywhere near fear, whereas the indigenous is it's an opportunity to practice a virtue like courage or generosity or patience or humility or honesty. Um, authority, we see authority, what, what dad told us, what the teacher told us, what the Pope told us, whatever. Whereas indigenous ways, the only authority, I mean, chiefs was, a, was a, a name given to us by the white man. The only authority was honest ex, uh, it, it reflection on lived experience under the umbrella that we recognize everything is interrelated. Uh, and, 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 and then the words are sacred. They're sacred vibrations, putting words out into the world. In, when, when the Lakota first were, had treaties broken by the white men, we did, they did ceremonies, praying for sanity to return, that they couldn't see reality, right? And now we're in a post-truth world. I mean, children lie at age three now. Um, so you look at, at, at well, what, what is not completely the truth about what I'm saying when I say, no, it's a good thing uh, to, 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 be, to, to, to have this, and it would be good for everybody or something like that, right? Um, and then, okay, I kind of think I want to move, move a little bit on this continuum toward the right more. How do I do it? I, you're not going to do it with willful determination because it's ingrained. So that goes into CAT concentration activated transformation, which is self-hypnosis, which is an easy thing to do. You don't have to pay somebody like me $300 an hour to do it. So you can do this kind of thing with all of it. All right. So Tess, what oh, anything you want to say? Or any, yeah, I did, I did, I did say anything. I mean, we got- Of course, can I just add one thing? Please, yeah, yeah please rule, please. Just a distinction and, and maybe, maybe I haven't analyzed this list, but you know, when we talk about introverted extroverted there's a suggestion that perhaps there's uh something um there are benefits to both sides and maybe the a flex it argues for kind of a flexibility perhaps maybe that's what you've just said that there are moments for introversion there's moments for extroversion but yeah I'm but wondering... this is not about introversion and extroversion that's something different all personality types and you can see indigenous people are very uh, one or the other just like anybody else right this is not about that right and I, and I probably shouldn't even have brought it up as an example right this is really very different you can be someone who's is, a, is an introvert and still be involved uh, with uh, community in a, uh, a much more engaged uh, in an engaged way and, 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 and not to, and not, and not, and, and, and contact and then sharing and then giving, right? Yeah. Well, the, the, the distinction, the distinction I was exploring was whether there were actually some elements of this list that, that might have that kind of, uh, positive duality and that others might really be value judgments that, that you know where, where both sides you really can't see both sides well no i think all of them you, I, let's take one now that you think there's no way that 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 you, you can't be on the right to be good or something like that i don't know um, lacking empathy I, I, all I, right so how do you yeah. argue for no empathy <laughs> okay okay you can you, 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 you it's not arguing for it remember it's about how one can balance the other there's nothing better to become empathetic than to witness somebody who is extremely non-empathetic. Would you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. So bingo, you just use a duality approach. That's what the indigenous people are saying. The, the complementarity idea of indigenous worldview isn't that, uh, you know, um, that this some is good sometimes and this is good sometimes, you know? No, it's not ever good. To, 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 to demean and have low respect for women. And it's never good to do that, right? Uh, Self-knowledge is always important, right? So this isn't about, oh, sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's okay to be not believe in spiritual energies. And sometimes it isn't. No, this isn't what this, this chart is saying at all, right? This chart is saying that, that if, if, if you can engage with the disbelief in spiritual energies and see that those who have that disbelief are great teachers and that, <clears throat> that there's something in that that can help you understand better the mistakes about 
spiritual understandings that you have and on and on. So it's a much, much more complex dynamic of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of things you're doing with architecture, really. It's, there's subtleties. And, and, and so complementarity is, uh, you know, is, 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 what, is what the indigenous worldview is, is about. Anybody else want to share anything? Marie. Well, thank you for yours. I was thinking about, I may put my camera on. I was thinking about something that you've talked about before and when we actually touched on this morning in Dr. Green's session, and that is our, our love of rules and setting up, uh, you know, guidelines and structures and, and, the, and the, the ways we're going to administer and behave and this and that. Um, rules, where would that fit? Our, our, um, our, our, our right present. here, number 34, read okay, 34. Oh, social laws of society are ah of society are primary, laws of nature are primary. Hmm. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. And so, what are we doing in our world today that is ignoring what we would refer to as the laws of of nature by creating our own social human based laws? What are we doing that that could be different and 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 better for the world if if we were prioritizing the, the the observation careful observation of 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 nature anything come to mind well let, let's think of a very concrete example let's say we have a rule in the classroom that there'll be no shouting we're not gonna we're not gonna scream uh, or, or in even in conversation we're not gonna scream at each other okay let's do that one so we have this 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 concept that hey we're, we remember because these are so interactive. Don't look at these as independent, right? And so if we say you know we really want to uh, have be, have generosity uh, and humor and and conflict resolution about returning to community and respect and so you know allow people to talk and allow people to do this you know because these things are all interrelated, right? And uh, um, but we have, you know, there, the, the, the school has this rule about shouting, right? Hey, I'm coming at this from a nature-based way. And if you feel that you're not violating a number of these things and you want to shout, baby, go for it, right? So if you are excited, and I've, I've seen this in a classroom, okay, on, 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 on Pine Ridge, uh, the, the Nebraska teachers, teach Lakota people and, and they're a border town that hates Lakota, Lakota people. So if you can imagine a teacher that doesn't like Lakota people teaching second and third graders, right? That's kind of the situation. And uh, um, one time I went to observe one of my student teachers and uh, she was having kids do what her instructor said and that is read out loud. And so each student would read out loud, the brown dog, da 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 right? right? And then there was one place where one child said, um, the weasel crawled under the fence. And right away, somebody shouted out, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh hey, hey. And they raised their hand. The teacher said, shh, we have no shouting in this room. Put your hand down. And what do you want to say? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, but uh, but but um, oh, uh, I know what a weasel is, right? And uh, and I knew half the class did not know what a weasel was, right? And uh, somebody else went, I don't, I would, I don't know what a weasel is, and they were shouting, uh, tell me, you know, in the second graders, the teacher slapped a ruler on the desk, not not the student teacher, she was Lakota, but the the, her, 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 her class teacher slapped the ruler on the desk and said, that's enough. Uh, and then pointed to another kid and said, read the next sentence, right? That I, I can just see from the, the, your body language that you can see the detriment that that did to, 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 the, to this natural ability uh, to express yourself, right? Now, I just pulled that off the top of my head as a way to answer it, Marie. There's, you know, I guess you gave me some time to think about it. We could find a lot of ways to do it. But again, it's saying, it, it's looking at the artificiality 
and the colonization, which is what this class is about, is the opposite of inclusion. And this story is a good one for that. The opposite of inclusion is decolonization. Now, what is colonization? It's making rules to oppress others and control others. So you got a rule, no shouting. That's a colonized rule if you just take it blanketly, which is how we usually follow our social rules. Mm. Right? There's no logic in a lot of the stuff. Go to court, you know, go to go to the DMV. I mean, there's rules that just aren't logical, right? Even in sports, I was playing, I, I got a granite ping pong table, right? And uh, I was playing with the, the fellow that's here from Colombia, right? And uh, he accidentally, after he hit the ball, kind of hit the table with the paddle. And he says, oh, that's your point. And I said, what do you mean? We, we got a good rally going. He says, well, there's the rule in ping pong that if you hit the table with your paddle, you automatically lose the point. And I said, ah, you know, come on, you know, what, what, you know, but anyway, I don't know if that's a good example or not, but there's a lot of rules about letter grading, about all these things like this. And um, do we, what if you, if you looked at the natural world, is there this, you know, is there, is there something that is comparable to, to, to letter grading? I mean, I can do it with any one of these things if you want to choose another one, right? That, but speak to me uh, if that, if there's any, if that helped a little bit or not. No, and, and you know, I, I see what you said earlier about fear and authority that's been ingrained in us, for example, that shouting is uh, means something bad. Right. And we, you know, that the fear that something something is out of control. Yeah. These or that are all I'm out of control or you're out of control and therefore um, something dangerous is has to happen, is going to happen if we don't control that. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and it, this is what's, this is, it, this is fun and dynamic. Um, when, um, uh, you know, um, th this idea of the, um, the opposite of exclusion is not inclusion, but decolonization. You know, I borrowed that from Nelson uh, Maldonado Torres, um, a, a Caribbean studies professor at Rutgers. And I really like it. I really like it, especially, you know, I, I wrote a book about the, the problematic of, of chief diversity officers. And I love, I love Allison and we're great friends, but you know, decolonization was not in her job description, not in her job description. And yet we got an indigenous person and my first talk with her, we talked about how important it is and she agreed. And now what is she doing? She's doing a lot of decolonizing stuff, right? Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it, the, if we look and understand that colonization has these two sides, one is it's recognizing the problematics of what happened to the original peoples of the earth who were colonized and who are continually in every country, including here in Mexico, you know, put down, uh, d disrespected in great poverty, you know, like lifespan on a Pine Ridge reservation, 49 for males, you know, it's, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. And so we've got to see decolonization as a way to fight that, to give their sovereignty and their land and their, their, their abilities to, to remember and, and uh, their, um, you know, their, their true uh, identities, which are, which are getting lost all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, let me tell you guys a joke. So um, on Pine Ridge, I, I lived on Pine Ridge uh, the, or a lot of the reservation and Bill Clinton, now part of this joke is true, like most indigenous jokes, and part of it is, is a made up. And so Bill Clinton was the only sitting president in the history of the United States to ever visit a, in, a uh, indigenous reservation. Can you believe that? And that's true and what, which are technically prison camps. Uh, Pine Ridge is prison camp number 4678, something like that. And uh, but anyway, he did come and he came because he wanted Pine Ridge to be an empowerment zone, which was very cool because right now you can't borrow money on Pine Ridge. That's why the people are freezing to death in trailers. They can't borrow money to fix things up. Government has organized all of this to assimilate and, 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 and continue the genocide. And uh, but he came and he stood up on top of this big sage and we had all the Lakota people were there. And he would say, 
If you guys continue to support me, we're going to get a, this empowerment zone passed here so people can come in here and have tax-free businesses. And everybody went, hoo yeah. And he said, and if you, if you uh, uh, continue to support my administration, instead of these commodities that we're giving you for us having been able to steal your land, uh, and we're not going to send you all this sugar because one out of two of you have diabetes. We're going to let you, we're going to get organic seeds and let you plant. Everybody went, hoo yeah. And he said, and these roads that are full of mud and the school buses are going off the road and kids are dying and stuff like that because we don't know what the jurisdiction or who's supposed to fix it. I'm going to take care of that. Went, everybody went, who are you? And he went on and on like that, right? And then he looked at his watch and realized he had to catch a plane. So he started to step off of the stage and uh, he stepped into a, because he, 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 he knew that the buffalo had, had, were no longer running free on the Pine Ridge because the cattlemen had bought all the land and there were cattle everywhere. And, and he stepped in a big cow pie. He was just about to, when a little Lakota boy said, oh, Mr. President, be careful. You're about to step in the huya. It's an indigenous joke. You have to think about it. Huya. Anybody? Anybody get it? All right. In other words, we knew it was all bullshit from the beginning. Everything that he was saying that would happen was huya, right? And... Uh, and that's kind of like what we're talking about in counter hegemonic work. What is hegemony or hegemony, however you want to say it? It's when the ruling elite makes us think that what we're doing is good for everybody, but it's only good for them. Why is Helen Keller and how we learned about Helen Keller in school, the classic example of hegemony? Anybody want to try to answer that? Why is how we learned? about Helen Keller in school, a classic exa example of educational hegemony. I've asked this with audiences of 100. Ah, Asik, somebody's raising their hand here. Go, go, go. Can you unmute yourself or do I have to do it? I want to unmute everybody if I can. Actually, Keely and I both had our hands up for something else. Oh, okay. All right, well, well you know, I'll just tell you then because we'll, I want to get to your question. What we know about Helen Keller is she was blind and deaf and, and, and courageous enough to talk, right? What we don't know about her is she was a member of the Wobblies, the International Workers of the World, the most radical labor union in the world. She was an uh, anti-war pacifist, filled Carnegie Hall up to speak against entry into the illegal war that World War I was. She, uh, she was a woman suffragist. Um, she, uh, uh, I mean, she was on J. Edgar Hoover's hit is one of the most dangerous women in, in America. We don't learn about all, all of these things about her because hegemony doesn't want us to learn that we can say, ah, I'm not going to the Iraq war is a bunch of baloney. Well, millions of us did know that. And now everybody knows it, that it was baloney. But if there had been people that saw Helen Keller's true heroic uh, a personality, we might have said, well, you know, I'm going to be a heroic her and I'm going to study this war and I'm going to not go to war. Same thing with, with labor unions and, and, and the benefit of labor unions. We've been brainwashed to think that they're all corrupt. And yet the, the facts are that where states are not right to work states, the mortality, morbidity is lower and the wages are higher, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and now we've gone from 53% of trades being, uh, being unionized in 1956 to 9%, right? So we don't want some hero that was a member of the most radical labor union in the world, goes on and on like this, right? Well, if we don't know about Helen Keller and we're in a doctoral program and the truth about her, you can't imagine all the other hegemonic things that there are that we are, that we are continuing. We wouldn't need to know the details, though, if we were practicing more consistently the, the, the worldview, right? If we were practicing more consistently the worldview, these things would, would be sort of Auto, automatic, right? They'd be automatic. So, all right, now you can ask your question. Actually, Keely had her hand up first. Okay, all right. Yeah, you know, I know I get so involved with what I'm doing and looking at you guys' face because it's the closest thing to being touchy feely, right? Is to look at you guys. I never, I never look at the uh, the chat box or all the other all, all the symbols. I'm sorry, that's my technological <laughs> bad. All right, so you go, yeah, you go ahead, Leah. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Keely. Hi, Austin. Nice to see you. <laughs> I haven't, haven't heard Austin's voice in a while. Um, so 
when you originally asked the question about how we see it play out, I've gone to business school and gotten my law degree. And so the first time I came across your chart and a lot of what other people were saying kind of reaffirming this, it is entrenched at least when I went through law school and, and got my MBA, the left side <laughs> of your chart is entrenched. Uh, and the scary part is, is that people are trained to think a certain way. It's entrenched within their profession. And I think businesses and the law are now going out and they're helping completely wreak havoc upon the earth. Um, social laws are what you're supposed to follow and not you know, looking at, you know, nature and, and kind of seeing the obvious in front of us. It's like, no, the law says this and this is the way we follow it. Um, businesses are focused on profits versus, you know, you know, curing the earth and, and making it a better place. They're very hierarchical, both. I mean, if you just look at the organizational structure of a lot of businesses, then lawyers, judges, very hierarchical. So I just, saw so many where I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like embedded, at least in these two professions that I've experienced with. And then I can see uh, the manifestations of the work being seen throughout our world globally uh, in so many places. Oh, thanks. Folks, thank you for that, that, that particular metaphor, for sure, the, the legal profession. I, I uh, entered University of Missouri Law School when I got out of the Marine Corps because they were paying, paying my stuff, right? And uh, um, and, and, and I quit after the first semester. And, and, and the uh, research that I've seen subsequent to that is the numbers of idealistic people that go into law to really change the world and really help defend innocent people. They've, the, the corruption of what has to go on with plea bargaining, all this stuff gets so much embedded, like you're saying, in this dominant worldview that, you know, they'll maybe continue on or change into, you know, another field, but uh, it, it's really, it, in fact, I wrote this book uh, in 1993. It's the, uh -huh. called The Bums Rush, The Selling of Environmental Backlash. When I learned that Rush Limbaugh and Roger Ailes and Fox News and the Republican party were conspiring to downplay the idea of climate, uh, they, you know, they used the word, it was used to be global warming. They even used right. Frank Luntz to get the hypnosis going with changing it to climate change, you know, like we do with, you know, instead of people that we kill, we call them, you know, uh, friendly casualties or whatever, right? And what, and what I do, did in it, I listened, my wife hated it, that she said, don't ever write a book like that again. But I listened to Rush Limbaugh for a year and I, and oh, I found out, because I was teaching hypnosis at UC Berkeley at the time yeah, okay. for MFCC licensure. And I looked and, and I saw that he was using hypnotic strategies, stories and metaphors, double binds, uh, uh, contingency, rapport, authority, humor, emotional words, pacing, questions, loaded questions, misrepresentations, after this, because of this, face value. And I took passages from his million seller book to show how people could identify when you're getting sucked in hypnotically and in the oratory of somebody, whether it's right or wrong. And you know who bought this book? I wanted environmentalists to buy it. Lawyers bought it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just had to share that with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank oh, no, you. I, I, I like that. Um, and it, it, it is just interesting as, as you have talked about how it's being put in place to make us believe certain things. So certain laws that on surface equal protection, everyone's protected. And then you look underneath it and it's circumvented and, you know, people of color, indigenous, are, you know, those laws that were supposed to protect us are destroying us. <laughs> so That's right. um, that and was another know, thing that had raised. Now, Vine Deloria Jr., Vine Deloria Jr., in this book, is he has a chapter. Uh, and the name of the chapter is, he speaks to what you just said. Um, chapter five, page 94. Conquest masquerading as mm. law. Conquest yeah. masquerading as law. And, and this is a very scholarly book the University of Texas published that I wrote. And uh, I'm telling you um, uh, what you just said. I mean, it's absolutely true. It's, it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And so we got our work cut out, right? And, and, yeah. and, and, and the, the missing link, I believe, is... You know, indigenous people didn't know the neuroscience 
of uh, of things. I'm, I'm just, it's so easy for me to do this because my, um, uh, I know these things that I've written. This book here, the original title, right now, I don't know if you can see it, it's Critical Neurophilosophy and in Indigenous Wisdom. When Greg Cajete, the foremost native scientist who was the director of native studies at University of New Mexico, and Jong Min Lee, a top neuroscience from South Korea, we got together and said, you know, everybody's gaga over neuroscience. In fact, Stanford had a little test that they sent to educators and they showed a, an article that was really a nonsense article, but when it had a brain on it with a bunch of lights lighting up, much more people believed it than when the brain wasn't on the paper, right? <laughs> and so we thought, wow, let's write a book and call it Indigenous Wisdom and Neuroscience or Neuropsychology. And we got 18 members of the Fielding uh, Graduate University. At that time, it was Fielding Graduate Institute. Uh, we got 18 people that were in the neuropsychology program and clinical psychology. And I said, would you guys like to get published? We got a good publisher. And they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, I want you guys to find state-of-the-art research, case studies on the, the, these, these primary pre, you know, uh, virtues that are built into the indigenous worldview, generosity, uh, you know, um, uh, humility, honesty, courage, et cetera. And I said, I want you to see what the neuroscience is saying. And, and, and I'm gonna show how neuroscience supports the importance of those things. Guess what? We were blown away by what the students showed. Mm -hmm. There were studies that, for example, uh, on generosity, where they, did monopoly games in a room where people were hooked up to uh, electronics that would read their brain imagery. And then when someone tapped them on somebody on a shoulder, they were supposed to give away boardwalk and their money or play money, right? As, as if that is an act of generosity. And, uh, and, and what they did see was that a place in the brain lights up that they knew lights up when you do a selfish act. And they found that that same place lit up when they did this generous act. Mm. And so the article went to say there is no such thing as altruistic generosity. All generosity in human beings is about getting something back. Mm. Bullshit. <laughs> Excuse my French. You can go into animal studies, interdisciplinary studies, you know, and, and find that there are many examples of pure altruistic generosity where there were no possible benefit to the species, to future generations, or to the self, right? Um, and so then the same thing with deception. Uh, somebody even wrote a big book on it, you know, the uh, deception as a survival mechanism or something like that, right? Uh, you know, making it look like camouflage was an act of, of the deception and that the animal world was full of lies and stuff like this. And, you know, it's just like, so anyway, I could go on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. You can get the book. You can read the book. But I said, I said, what are we going to do? We're going to not write this book. We got a contract, right? So we changed the title and we coined the idea critical neurophilosophy. In other words, we were going to be philosophical and critical about the worldview through which the medical profession or the legal profession or the education profession sees things hypnotically. And this idea of hypnosis, um, you know, uh, ceremony is hypnosis. When you go and do ceremony and trance-based healing is, you know, was, is, infamous among shamans and things like this we if we think that they wouldn't let me i wrote i'm sorry i'm going to keep grabbing books here because they were reminding me prentice hall published this book when i was an emt patient communication for first responders the title i wanted was emergency hypnosis they would not their lawyers would not let me use the word hypnosis right mm. you know uh even though that's what it is well guess what one of your colleagues bram duffy and the uh uh, he's just graduating. He's doing his FOR in, in two weeks. He happens to be a paramedic and I'm on his committee. I'm on his chair. And uh, he um, did, a, did a really cool thing about paramedics uh, uh, having more innovation if they weren't following the rules. Going back to Marie's part point, um, if they weren't following the rules, they had more creativity and were, and were doing better on the scene of an emergency. Right. 
And I, I told him about my book and he, and it, it was banned. It was banned. I was in Brisbane, Australia, speaking to 1500 emergency room physicians. And at the break, they came up and said, we can't order your, your book, Dr. Jacobs, before I went, oh, wow. went by my Lakota name. And uh, I called my publisher and they said, well, we remaindered it. I didn't know what that word was, but I mean, it's taking it off the market because a medical doctor, PhD, big shot, wrote an article in GEMS, the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, the premier you know, journal of emergency medicine, saying this material should be used only by a licensed physician with an MD who is certified in medical hypnosis by the American hypnosis examiners. Of course, I was writing it for paramedics and it was saving lives. I mean, I've got, I got emails for saving lives. Well, what's really cool, I'll just share with you, Bram said, I can't believe we got to get this book out. We got to get this book out. I said, well, you know, it was 25 years ago I wrote it and I'm so frustrated by it. I just, you know, I use it, but I, I, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. And uh, he says, can we get it republished? And I said, I'll give it to you. Get it republished. He got a publisher last month. Routledge oh, Publishing. Yeah. Routledge is going to publish it. And, uh, and, he, and he said, Forrest, I don't want to be lead author on this. I, I, you got to please be, be on, on the cover with me. You, please let it be your book, too. And you be the lead author. It's your material. You know, we're gonna, and I said, no, whatever. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm with him on it. And uh, Rotwood sent us the contract two weeks ago. And uh, in the contract, they changed the working title that we had and they took hypnosis out of it, just like Prentice Hall did, saying, ah, oh, people misunderstand hypnosis too much. And, and I said, I will not sign this contract, Bram, if we don't have hypnosis in the contract. And Bram said, I'm with you on that. And so we told that to the publishers. And I said, yeah, hypnosis has been bastardized and Hollywoodized and misunderstood and misrepresented. And all the religions are against it. All the Abrahamic religions are against it, et cetera. But if you want to know about brain surgery or healing hemophilia and, and, and or, 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 or what, you know, you go and you look up clinical hypnosis and you go to proper places. You don't go to the baloney on it, right? You're going to lose that resource if we don't call this what it is, right? So that the book is coming out after 20 years. But this idea of words and decolonization, does anybody else has a question before I, I go on? I love in the question. I think yeah. uh, um, Asa has had her hand up. So is yeah, yes, Asa, question. okay. I better get to that place where they show that. Okay, I see that. All right, good. Can you unmute on your, there you go. Asa, it's all yours. So I think it's interesting, a um, few things. Um, when I was in class with Ava and she's part of the indigenous community, um, being a trans man, sometimes non-binary, um, I asked if I was appropriating culture if I were to use indigenous methods. And she said that I was accepted in intrinsically by the indigenous community. Um, also, another thing I'm wondering is that with the touching um, number 18 on the list, during the pandemic, how is it balanced out by the indigenous community? Two good questions. Let me address, address both of them. Everyone uh, maybe write this down, put in the in and uh, the indigeneity controversy, the indigeneity controversy, colon, for whom, by whom. And read my article. It's a peer reviewed article that's uh, published by Critical Education out of the University of British Columbia. And you can read the whole thing for free online. Okay. And I answer your question with scholarship in that. So that's why I say that, because we won't have time to, to go into detail. Um, misappropriation of indigeneity and playing Indian is a major, major, major problem. However, Indian country is divided down the middle about what is allowed for people that are not indigenous, meaning the UN definition, which essentially the UN definition is self-identity because Blood quantum was a government way to divide and conquer and, 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 and has been hurtful, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, the almost all First Nations, their original ways of identification 
with self-identity supported by the tribal endorsement of that identity. So this is why adoption, this is why people that, 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 that were, that were, and I just wrote the book on sitting bull, you know, some people went AWOL from the Calvary, the, uh, the U S Cal, you know, the, the U S Calvary and, and, and went to live with the Indians. And when they were adopted, they became Lakota, right? Okay. So misappropriation, I told you separate, make a distinction between place-based knowledge, which we, we can't misappropriate because we are ignorant of the languages and, and living in one place for centuries. Right. But worldview is about nature based learning. And we are all indigenous to mother earth, but Indian country is divided down in the middle on this. I have many indigenous brothers and sisters that will not endorse my, my efforts to put this into education. And I, you know, I talk with them. Uh, they say that's the worst place to put it. That's what caused our problems, which is true. But uh, and they say, you know, not in, in, in like in my Sundance, Rick Two Dogs only allows indigenous people to Sundance, but he doesn't allow it. I mean, he does allow indigenous people to do you weepy ceremonies and an ceremonies. And I asked him one day, so why do you allow this and not here? He says, well, I'm no, no reason in my mind. It's just the spirits told me that this is a ceremony that I don't want it to get accidentally corrupted by people coming in and, you know, like in Arizona, you know, people did uh, Nipi ceremonies, uh, purification lodges, $18 million a year a guy was making, didn't know what he was doing, killed four people. That, that, that sweater, I don't know if you guys know about that happened in Arizona. Lakota Nation sued uh, and he's in jail for, jail for manslaughter, right? So it's a real issue that we got to respect both sides, but fool's crow, white standing buffalo, very, very highly respected shamans say, anyone who does not want to share this medicine and have others who have good hearts to share it in the world doesn't know the medicine. But you're, but you're right, you're, you're going to be nailed whichever side you're on. I'll give you a real brief story. I'm a found, co-founder of the STAR program in Arizona for Navajos. A service to all relations is the school, a wonderful school. And we were doing a fundraiser and I'm playing, I play old American jazz on the piano and uh, my wife plays the banjo and we were playing music for a fundraiser. And as we were putting the instruments away, Oh, the last song I played was a ceremonial song. It was a thank you song. Meaning deep gratitude. And I wanted to end the song that way. As soon as I'm putting my, my, my piano away, pretty respected Navajo spiritual leader comes up to me and scolds me. Four arrows. You know better than to take that out of the circle. And just, oh, this circle, all these white people from Flagstaff that were here. I tapped him on his shoulder. And I said, my brother, I thank you. And we disagree. Not a minute later, another very respected spiritual leader. I like to say he was more respected. <laughs> comes up to me and he says, four rows, hugs me. Thank you for taking that out of the circle. We need to teach this to the, to the, to the white people, et cetera, right? So I hope that answers that part of the question, but read my article, okay? As for the COVID, the, the Council of Elders that I'm part of at, at, on, of the Oglala Medicine Horse Teospay, at the beginning of the, the, uh, this pandemic, sent out words that all of us who are authorized to pour the water and the Anipi ceremony, no one will smoke the pipe. Like we usually have people smoke the pipe. No one will smoke the pipe. You will just smoke it yourself and use your eagle wing to put that smoke out into everybody else in, from a distance, right? Only four people, only three other people can go into the lodge. There can be no more than four people, one for each direction. No, and knowing that the intense heat in the lodge was going to, and the spiritual work, no one was going to catch it inside the lodge. But they made that rule. So I, that's kind of a, a compromise, you know, example. And, but a lot of people did die because they over, they, they, they weren't able to separate from that, you know, ceremonies where people die in every so often on our reservations and there's people that all show up and they all and so it was it was very difficult for people and that's why 
after New York and New Jersey were the two worst places in the world because of their pollution and air, this virus likes to move over polluted air. Navajo Nation became the third worst, and then it became the worst. Uh, my theory on that is, is because although they don't have the traffic and, and, and they don't have, you know, industry, they have 620 untapped uranium mines. And the research shows that that air is, has that kind of pollution, right? So, so it's, it's, you know, but then the Lakota Nation, they set up roadblocks saying, we're going to control this. We're not going to let tourists into, into Pine Ridge. But then the governor, a right-wing Republican governor of Lakota, of the uh, South Dakota, said it was illegal for them to put the roadblocks up, stopped them from doing it. And they were friendly roadblocks. They were, people walked up with masks and they stood a distance away from the car and they said, you know, things, would you, would you be willing to take a test? And if you take the test and pass it, then you can come in. Very respectful. But the governor put the quash on it and then the death rates on the Lakota went up, right? So complicated kind of question, but it's about it's about love, com loving, common sense, empathy, knowledge. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's not it's, a, it's complex. It's complex. So I hope that gives you a, at least a little bit of of a perspective on it. Yeah, it was just um, interesting because you're intrinsically more touchy. Um, so that was interesting part of the unique part of COVID. Yeah, I mean, what we do when people come over, if they just got off the bus or plane or they, whatever, and they've been in a big city, you know, we like stand apart from each other and we, we do the hugging motion, you know, and, you know, I love you, man. I wish I could, you know, if we fear that the, the exposure was minimum or whatever, then we hug and we don't breathe into each other's face or whatever. I mean, it's all about common sense and, and doing what you feel it, it, it is is the rest, right thing to do, you know. So, thank you. I mean, we have a different attitude about the virus too. We see it as an entity, and 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 so there's a communication process that would really be hard for me to explain. Let me try it this way. I did a presentation. I think it was at Fielding, actually. I was invited to be on the soil panel. Was anybody at the soil conference? Marie, were you at it? So they got three top soil engineers to talk about the state of the earth and how what you know, like food isn't doesn't have nutrition anymore because of, of it's growing in you know and in, in fertilized land and all this stuff. And each one of them gave a presentation on soil. Brilliant stuff. I learned a lot. And then it was my turn, and 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 and, uh, and they brought me because they, uh, I, the the group that put it together wanted an indigenous perspective. So I kind of like came up and I I winked at the at the group before I went up, so they knew something was coming. And I said, you know, I learned a lot from these these three professors on soil. And and what they said was brilliant and and right on, but it ain't going to do any good. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the audience went what how rude you are you know and i looked back at them and i winked again you know and i said seriously i and i said let me refer to three other people that i also have a high respect for like i do these three gentlemen that i met earlier today i'm going to refer to franklin delano roosevelt mahatma gandhi and wendell berry I, I think all of them have done some good work in the world. Let me tell you what they say about soil. Roosevelt says, um, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Gandhi says, to forget how to dig in the earth and to tend to soil is to forget ourselves. And Wendell Berry, the famous environmentalist, said, without proper care of the soil, we can have no life. I said, that's those kinds of wise statements are comparable to what we learned from the panel, except they gave a little more science behind it. Those aren't, they, they, those do any good? No, they haven't done any good, right? I said, now, and, and I had this on a slideshow. I said, now let me read you a quote on soil from an indigenous person that still, you know, and, and they, and still knew the indigenous ways, which are fewer and fewer. 
uh, Chief Seattle, pretty famous speech. And he wrote, and I'm going to have to get it because I don't, hold on. Okay. He wrote, and I want to ask you to tell me the difference between the three that I, that I read and this one. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Even the rocks thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people. And the very dust upon which we stand responds lovingly to our footsteps. Who wants to give a shot at how that is significantly different than the other three and how that might make a difference in the world if we, if we thought that way compared to the other three. Anybody? Tessa, did I see you raise your hand? No. Leah? No, but I'm more than happy to, to respond. Um, to me, the last one, he talks about the soil responding back and forth. It isn't us caring for the soil. It's the soil and the people having a conversation and having being in relation. Reciprocity, right? Yeah. Yep, the, the reciprocity. And also, what, anybody else? Just jump in. The, the, also, the, 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 the ana, animism of, of it. I mean, you know, how can a rock thrill with memories? That's, that's not a common way to think in the dominant worldview, is it? Right? That you go out and pick up some dirt. Do you think that that dirt has the intelligence, the sentience to be able to thrill with memories of stirring events? Is that some kind of a new age, crazy idea? Can the dust respond lovingly to your footsteps come on what is that hogwash right i mean that's where most of us are that's where i was until i began to to my just to to, to to live with with people that still lived in the old ways the old ways the raramuri simiron people deep in copper canyon the, the kunhak of sonora the kogi of columbia you know, the pockets of people that on, 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 on the Oglala. And then I began to experiment, experience. Rick Two Dog used to come up to me. Rick Two Dog was the, my Sundance chief. He used to come up to me and put his arm around me. And when so, I saw a miracle, he would put his arm around me and say, Hey, Doc, analyze that. <laughs> yeah and so so that's very different obviously and and the audience got it just like you guys did i mean they 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 you know and they even said a few things that i hadn't thought of before right um well that's how we live 24 7 you know i often will, will pe have people uh in a conference when they when they come in at a workshop i'll say set your stuff down please but don't sit down outside the hallway and, and i did this in santa barbara once I, you know you know and there's those glass doors where you walk out and there's all these plants with palm trees in them and stuff i said i want you to just go out the door go out the door i want you to touch a plant and come back in so people look at me like i'm kind of crazy and uh <laughs> they come back in and they start to sit down and i go well wait a minute everybody did that yeah okay i want you to remember that experience i want you to go out one more time and now they're really looking at me, right? And I've done this all over. I've done this all over the world. I've done this with Buddhist monks. I've done it with uh, uh, prisoners. Um, this time, I want you to go out and you touch the same plant or a different one, doesn't matter. But before you touch it, I want you to ask permission. And you're gonna laugh. And I want you to wait for an answer. So people usually, you know, uh, you know, especially the, the tough guys, right? The juvenile delinquents, you know. But when they come back, I've never had it where there wasn't either silence or whispering or whatever. And then when people report out, never had it where there wasn't one or two people cry. And I've always had it where people have said, ah, oh, you know, I don't know how to explain this. And I'm not saying I heard it per se, but this one of them said, I, I heard this, 
this plant say that it had lost its relative in a hurricane or something like that and and that that it, it missed it missed i mean you know i mean they you know they, they try to put it into words and they know how silly it sounds but they all say it they all say it i said imagine living that way 24 7 imagine living that way 24 7 that's why you know the new book that just came out one of the most scholarly books you can read 790 pages by uh, uh anthropologist of great uh, respect and an ant and, and an archaeologist of respect it's called the new the, the dawn of everything a new the the the, the you know a new history of of, of uh, humanity and they show you know and uh, the 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 evidence of our pre-contact our pre-colonial world in terms of peace in terms of women in terms of all these kinds of things right um, um day after tomorrow i'm giving a presentation at i'm the first male to have ever given one since they founded in 2001 the uh, international feminists for gift economies and uh, and they're all about the matriarchal matrilineal you know why the cultures were that way and the, and the peacefulness of it but this new book just blows out of, all out of the water almost all the old anthropology and archaeology that has gotten popular because it, it it says things like you know centralized government and civilization is a good thing because the savages were you know did this and they killed they they burned their kids and all this stuff i mean that People from Oxford and UCLA have written it. I can read it to you out of my book, out of my book on learning the language of conquest. So, so, you know, this is something that belongs to all of us and the colonized thing. Yeah. It has to still include trying to do our best to, to help the, the people who are on the front line, like, you know, standing rock and all the places in the world, but it's also about us re-indigenizing ourselves with the precepts, the interrelated precepts and using what I call the cat fawn connection as a, as what uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, I have, yeah, I thought you had to be dead before someone wrote a biography of you, but this is a uh, Dr. Michael Fisher. He's a professor um, and his specialty is in, is in fearology. And so he interviewed me for about three years. And if you look at this, there's a, there's a, a hundred, average of 150 footnotes after each chapter. I haven't read it. I, I haven't read it. It's just like it's so academic, right? But you know, he he talks about the the importance of the these these worldview precepts and 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 how one goes about you know from being on uh, all the way over here to starting to be on that continuum and trying to work over here and and practicing fearlessness. By the way, fearlessness the way I just I define it almost. Gandhi was the only one that actually was the only scholar that really talked about it. Almost everybody else from Socrates to recent psychologists say fearlessness is foolishness. But this is how I've, I've experienced this with indigenous peoples and in my studies, my second doctorate after my near death experience, where I had a vision about the cat and the fawn based on two animals that we came upon. The Ronald Murray Indian was, had run one down. They're great runners. And, and, and had the fawn over his shoulders. And then I, after I went through a hole in the water and had a near death experience, we had to escape through the mountains. And we were in a cave with the water rising and about ready to drown when a mountain lion walked right over our sleeping bag. Dave Carr was a fellow firefighter, a friend of mine, and uh, showed us the way out, right? And so then later on, as we were climbing out of this 8,000 foot canyon, I had a vision of the letters and and they turned into concentration activated transformation and start with four of the worldview precepts indigenous approaches to fear authority words and nature and then just begin with that for your trans transformations right um and so uh you know that's a really good thing to to practice to to make this uh real and i think i think that we're uh out of time and before Eris, this is Marie, I just want to offer um, a reminder to everyone that we're going to talk about um, why is a decolonized curriculum important to me uh, in just a half an hour in a three practice circle that Christy Harrison, who's on on with us today, is going to is going yeah. to facilitate. So please all join us. We're going to continue the. the oh, that's so great. That is so great. And, yeah. you know, I was really I was 
you know, I, you know, I, I've been kind of a radical for the a radical at fielding for the past 20 years. And Maria, you even said, boy, are they going to accept that and this kind of stuff? Um, but I was surprised that the clinical psychology department actually invited me to do a presentation on decolonizing the syllabi. Oh. And, I, and I told you how, you know, that right off the bat, somebody kind of attacked me, but then came around. Well, you should see the letters I've gotten from clinical psychology program. And, uh, and they gave me examples, you know, they, they brought out their syllabi, well, what's wrong with this, right? And we talked about it and they went, oh man. And the positive feedback, you know, I, I wish I could get that from SLS, right? And here was the part, the program is probably the most colonized than anybody, right? And here they are, they were really getting it because to be frank, psychology, the field of psychology is even more colonized than the field of law which we talked about earlier all right you guys thank you for Eris. Uh, thank you so much let me just real fast Olivia, do you want to ask a quick question yeah i got time i, I just know you guys are having to rush off yeah leah i wanted to make sure you had your question in here before we sign off <laughs> uh this, i i want to be respectful of everyone's time um i think it was a, a broader conversation about um how uh, the, the potential impacts to individuals' mental health of living in a world that has distanced so far from these tenets of a holistic worldview. Um, and sort of, you know, from an anecdotal experience, I, I, I see friends who struggle with anxiety, depression, things of that nature, which are, are very complicated um, to begin with, but they speak of of challenges and, and feelings that so radiate or resonate with me for everything that's on the left side of this chart. Um, and just if there's any any conversation that you think is appropriate to have there. Um, join us, join us uh, on Saturday uh, at the uh, international, uh, just send me an email, I'll send you the registration form, but it's the International Feminist for Gift Economy. Uh, and um, Darsha Narvaez from uh, Notre Dame uh, University, she's uh, an award-winning developmental psychologist who talks about how the, the uh, non-Indigenous approach to child rearing for, from prenatal to five, six, seven years old has created the mental illnesses that continue into, into, into adulthood. Uh, and you might, you might find that, that, that interesting. All right, I'm going to close. This is a, this is a on the Trail of Tears. You guys can find out what it is if you don't know. But it was a it was more brutal than any, well, than maybe what most of us are experiencing. Maybe there are other people in Haiti and other places that are experiencing this now, of course, in Ukraine. But um, the women sang this song to the children every night in the throes of being.